This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. I'm Edward Conlon, host of Talk To Me, the new podcast about the origin of hostage negotiations. Through the first-hand accounts of the NYPD's hostage negotiation team founders, we delve into real cases, big and small, to hear how the team pioneered the use of psychology to save lives. Their motto was, talk to me. It changed policing forever. Listen to, follow, rate, and review Talk To Me now at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts, beginning October 19th. This week on the podcast, we welcome Sarah Hader. She is an activist and writer. Sarah has spent much of her professional life in the charitable world, co-founding two nonprofit organizations. Her work has been covered in numerous outlets, including BBC, The Economist, The Stranger, and Quillette, and was recognized as a free thought heroine by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, she spends more of her time thinking and writing about belief, social dynamics, and culture on her substack, Hold That Thought, or chatting with author Megan Daum on their podcast, A Special Place in Hell. Sarah and I had a great conversation. She's one of my favorite heterodox thinkers out there, and I hope you enjoy getting to know her a little bit. All right. I'm with Sarah Hader, everybody. Welcome to Walk Ins Welcome. Thank you for taking time to come through. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm really excited. I am too. I've just, I've always wanted to, I love this podcast because I feel like I really get to know people that I'm already huge admirers of. And I'm just such a huge fan of your work and all of your writing, particularly your writing and the way that you view a lot of this culture war stuff. It seems to come from a more rational, reasonable place. And I don't know if anyone in my audience isn't familiar with you. They should be because I think you're kind of like an oasis of sanity. (laughs) (laughs) Whether you feel that way or not. Oh, Yeah, I mean, these days I'm feeling pretty crazy, but I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, so... I can give a little introduction of myself for your audience. Mm -hmm. My name is Sarah Hader. I got into the scene, so to speak, I mean, the public discourse space as an atheist activist, specifically an ex-Muslim activist. And if anyone is familiar with that discourse, when ex-Muslims are kind of the a uh, redheaded stepchild of the atheist world, like me. <laughs> uh, <we're, laughs> isn't that a terrible? <laughs> um, little, <laughs> we can still uh, say that, I think. Can, yeah, okay. All right. Redheads are okay. We can, uh, we can still we go can. after redheads. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's an unpopular stance because, it, you know, atheism as a whole is perfectly progressive and, like, very welcome in um, among the left. But when you start including in criticisms of Islam and ex-Muslims necessarily, I mean, just by, by virtue of being an ex-Muslim, there's a, there's a reason you're leaving. Right. And for some people it's 100% logical, very rational, like, you know, contradictions in the Quran, that kind of thing that, that gets you to leave the faith with others. Human rights aspects have a lot to do with it. Treatment of women have a lot to do with it. So, you know, ex-Muslims bring up those issues and talk about those issues, but on, you know, the progressive left, this was, you know, I quickly found out something that you couldn't really, you know, I couldn't do. Christians could, ex-Christians could talk about Christianity all they wanted and, you know, even make fun of Christianity all they wanted. I was not allowed the same kinds of freedom. So I started to see this double standard and investigate why it was happening. And that led me to just this much larger culture war and whatever that's been going on 
with the progressive left in the past couple of years. And I try not to think about it in terms of right or left Mm -hmm. anymore, but that's just how I started and what I was thinking of at that time. Now I'm a a much more apolitical figure, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I, I, I am thinking a lot more these days about, you know, why we do what we do, just the sexual dynamics, uh, social dynamics. And I'm finding these kinds of things very interesting and I write about them. So, you know, I began in the nonprofit world, in the activist space. I co-founded two, two nonprofits, actually. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm just doing some broader thinking and speaking. And it's been very, you know, I have to say, like, I used to be such a peppy person. And I would show up on these podcasts, and I would be like, jumping up and down and like very excited to talk about even though my my what I was speaking of was very grim, you know, it was very grim work, but I was just excited to have the opportunity to, to make a change in the world in this very, you know, like, naive kind of way. But in the past couple of years, I feel like my view has become a lot more grim. <laughs> I I can understand that. I actually struggle with the same thing being, but I wasn't an, I, it's interesting because I was apolitical and then I kind of ended up in the same place that I started, <laughs> which is that <laughs> LOL, none of this matters. But it's I I feel like it has to be kind of disheartening when you start out as an activist to get to a point where why would you say you feel more grim? Well, uh, I mean, it's hard to know whether a lot of people say, you know, my I have a podcast with Megan Daum called A Special Place in Hell. And Megan is older than me. She's in her 50s. So she remembers a very different time. Mm -hmm. She remembers things that I, I never experienced, you know, like we would, we would talk, we'll talk about, oh, the other day we were talking about a piece published by this, this lesbian woman in the village voice. And it was basically a criticism of transgenderism back then called transsexualism. And it was like pretty scathing actually. Mm -hmm. And something that is unpublishable everywhere today not just mm-hmm. i mean of course the village voice you never ever would touch anything like that again but but unpublishable everywhere and it you know so megan says that something's changed something in the intellectual sphere has changed you know we can call it the the new wokeism religion or a variety of other things other factors institutional factors that have come into play to affect our discourse overall but there was a freedom that we had to talk about issues that mattered openly and honestly, and we don't have that freedom anymore. I've never seen this freedom, right? I never personally experienced it. I read about it. I read these old archives and I see what people said and I imagine that, okay, maybe they were living in a very different time. But since I've been active, I've only ever seen this kind of once called political correctness, but now it feels way more authoritarian than that. It feels like coercion, uh, to not talk about certain things openly and honestly. Um, and so, you know, as an activist, I I was an activist, am an activist, because, you know, in my, my, in my heart of hearts, I'm a believer in people and a mm-hmm. believer in change. And I wanted to be part of that change. I wanted to help make the world a better place. And it came from this, na- you know, some would consider naive place, but also a very optimistic, positive place of of believing in progress and believing in our shared capabilities to get to that more progressive state, you know, using the tools that we have ahead of, uh, that we have in front of us, our reason, our compassion, our empathy. And, you know, when I first started, it, d- it wasn't so evident to me what was wrong because I was encountering some problems. I thought they were just misunderstandings. Mm-hmm. I thought if I talked to, if I, if I informed enough of my fellow, you know, progressives or whatever about what is going on in the Muslim world and how ex-Muslims suffer, you know, I mean, there's, there's still a dozen or so countries in the world where you have a death penalty for being an apostate, for leaving the mm-hmm. faith. I mean, think, think about, like it's it's that's an unheard of thing in yep. in anywhere in the West where where you could just for simply leaving a faith, 
you have that kind of extreme criminal sanction. And that, that doesn't include the variety of other you know, criminal punishments for blasphemy or apostasy that are less severe than that mm-hmm. all over the Muslim world. So you, you're looking at a stigma that is very severe. And that's just in that one realm. If we talk about women's rights, gay rights, whatever, you explode into this just quagmire. And then I thought if I had just told people about this, if I just informed them that what, what was happening was that people didn't know enough about what was happening on the ground and what ex-Muslims were facing, what progressives and leftists and liberals in the Muslim world were facing. And if I told them all this, if I educated people, they would change and they would support me and they would recognize I was one of them. And I, as I started to do that, as I started to do that education, I found that it really didn't move the needle as much as I thought it would for a lot mm. of people. And then it occurred to me that there was something else going on in the background, that there are, you know, incentives for behaving in a certain way that are far more, you know, they're more reptile brain than, <laughs> than right. you know, neocortex, like where it's, uh, it, there's social dynamics going on here that are unsaid and unexamined, really, um, that are pulling people away from recognizing the reality of Islam. Right. So then it became like, what? well, what's going on? Let's, let's look into this. What's happening? What is um, going and, on? I mean, uh, a lot of things, I think. I don't, I don't have one clear answer. I think there, there are a lot of interesting theories about wokeism and if we can call it wokeism, right? If we can call this one rot wokeism, then there, there are multiple theories. Some say it's purely institutional or primarily institutional, um, stemming from, you know, HR departments, but really it, it, it spreads everywhere over time, sort of drips into regular culture. If you can't say it in the workplace, you can't say it as a professional person. Suddenly, you know, you have this broader difficulty in engaging in honest discussion. But I, I think there's more to it than that. There's an activism wing that's very <laughs> prominent. Mm-hmm. And as an activist, I've seen it. There's a lot of people don't know this. Unfortunately, Maybe it's due to the inequality in the United States or, or something else. But for for many reasons, majority of nonprofits are funded by like the top, like 5% of their donors make up like 90% of their income. Right. You know, it's a very, very uneven, very, very skewed funding base. And that's the case for everyone across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might be it might be just because we have people who are like billionaires, and they just have a lot of extra money, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so they're just giving mm-hmm. it away being good people, they're giving it away. But the the indirect effect of that is that some people have a huge voice um, in the activist world, they can get their special projects funded. So if if we have an ideology, let's call it wokeism for the purposes of this podcast, if we have uh, this ideology that has taken over an elite class, you know, the uh, for, for, for many reasons, but it's a, taken over the elite class, it's their official religion. Now they can, you know, because they care about these values, they can put in a lot of money into these nonprofits mm-hmm. that will spread these values around and act as pressure groups to institutions that might not be so captured, you know, institutions right. that want to be nonpartisan. Well, there is, you know, ACLU and, you know, and ACLU is a very, it's in it's in itself like this, this institution that was so respectable and has become so strangely activist yeah. in recent times, you know, so you have these, you have these interest groups, these pressure groups that are always pushing for the values of a teeny tiny minority of people the teeny tiny minority, which happens to be captured by one ideology, they think more or less in the same way. So that's that's part of it, right? So you have the, the this HR element that's stemming from, I mean, I can't speak eloquently or intelligently about this, but stemming from, the, they say, civil rights era legislation and its interpretation. And then you have what is happening in activism and how it's funded, that it's pushing, you know, really one perspective on the world. And I think that... There's there's a bunch of other things that come together to create this mm-hmm. strange cultural place that we're in. Yeah, it's it's been fascinating for me. And I think I'm probably in between you and Megan in age. I'm not I don't know your age, but 
that that's just my guess is that I'm kind of on the cusp. So I, I like Megan remember a time I'm always like, what happened to the nineties? You know, (laughs) and then younger people don't seem to remember this. And, and it's interesting. I've talked to a lot of ex Muslims and the Islam thing is always a fascinating, like you said, this kind of weird redheaded stepchild area of progress where you would think that they would be able to look at this and say, we can separate some of these things, but ultimately people who leave have more authority on this than you person who's sitting in a Seattle cafe who knows nothing about the religion. That's what's so crazy to me about there. There's this idea that you're supposed to, you know, everybody has their kind of truth and their, you have to honor somebody's lived experience. But in this one (laughs) area, no one, they don't honor yours or Yasmin Mohammed or Ayan Hirsi Ali. None of your lived experience seems to matter at all. Yeah, yeah. It reveals to me how that idea of lived experience is is not truly a principle that they believe in. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a will to power. It's something, it's a it's it's something they enact in order to get their way when they want to get their way. Um and it, the best illustration of that is how little the lived experiences of people who disagree with, you know, the whatever woke orthodoxy matters. I mean, how little uh, even like black conservatives how little they matter, how little mm-hmm. their experiences matter. And it, it, that reveals a, it reveals that, you know, they don't really mean what they say either. Right. right. It's all about power. That's, that's what's, I think, so frustrating about even trying to combat it, like you said, with reason or holding somebody to a standard. And this is just all across the board. If everybody's willing to abandon their standards because they are in a power struggle and that is the default, like, well, it's, It's okay because we need, if we don't abandon these standards, then we'll lose. I don't see that as an escalating force for good at all. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it becomes a power struggle and then no, and I feel like that's really the place we're in where everybody's willing to say, you know, I might be pro-life, but I don't care what this person did because I want control of, of the Senate. Or I might be progressive, but who cares what these ex-Muslims are saying because they'll be view will be Islamophobic. I don't I don't yeah. I don't really even that's that's a weird one too that we've been seeing a lot just around all the stuff in Iran. You're always yeah. like, where are the Western feminists on this? You know, yeah. con- and you constantly hear from a lot of these activists and yeah. women who are ex-Muslims and women in Iran themselves saying saying we don't necessarily need you, but the silence is kind of deafening. Yeah, yeah, and it's if you say that feminism is is really about women and not about the specific, you know, neurotic (laughs) desires and needs of white collar, Western, you know, women in New York (laughs) specifically, right? right? I mean, if you, if you, if you say that it's this universal thing, then you really do have to acknowledge universal struggles and Mm. assist them when possible. But, you know, feminism, you know, personally, I think it's, in the West, whatever it is that we have, it's not feminism. I think feminism died a while back. I think what we have now is, you know, a skinwalker that, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> but, you know, something that's just, um, it's, it's, uh, it's in HR departments and it's, it's, um, it giving out hot takes on, on the guardian about fat phobia or, or, how cold the office is and what this means for, you know, yeah, for <laughs> women patriarchy. everywhere. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the not... dumber ones that like constantly <laughs> resurfaces over and over again. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, they, rev- it's just so, uh, so meaningless, you know, the more yeah. it's, it's just gripes from, of uh, coming from a very privileged class of people mm. who are, who are, covering their, you know, 
personal needs and desires and annoy daily annoyances in this you know cloak of uh, this broader civil rights struggle. Like, I am actually noble for bringing up, you know, for writing endlessly about how office ACs are sexist. You know, that's a- <laughs> <laughs> It's true. It is true. It is something that in the past would have just been a gripe. You're right. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Hey, small business leaders, are you looking for an easy way to onboard and manage remote employees? JustWorks makes it easier for you to start, run, and grow a business. Let me tell you how JustWorks can help your business. I'm a small business owner, and I am not great at the business part. As many creatives find themselves in this quandary, JustWorks takes so much of the challenging aspect of all of the admin out of my equation and puts it in the hands of a amazing ultimate HR platform for small and growing businesses. And it has simple software and expert support and it works all across the country. So if you're onboarding people in different states, it has the different rules and regulations depending on what state your employee is in. And whether your team is remote or in person, You can give them access to national large group health insurance plans and manage onboarding, PTO, payroll, HR, compliance, all in one place. JustWorks makes it simple to hire and manage remote employees across all 50 states. Find out how JustWorks can help your business by going to JustWorks.com. That's JustWorks.com for more info. Walk-ins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening to me talk, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. So what is your kind of origin story? How did, where were you born? Were you born in America? Where I don't know anything um, I about was born, I was, yeah, I was born in Pakistan. Um, okay. I was, I came to America at a, Youngish age, it was like seven or eight or something when we came to America. But I remember, I remember the experience of learning English. It's my mm. second language. Um, and now that I've said that, people will be like, I hear an accent. You don't hear an accent, okay? I don't have yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, That's um, just, <laughs> those are the racist identifying yeah, right. themselves. I yeah. hear an accent. <laughs> that accent is your racism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I was fairly young still, but I remember the experience of of coming over and like learning a bunch of new stuff. And you know, it's very, very much one of my first real vivid memories is that mm. immigration process and coming to the United States. So I I identify very powerfully with, you know, the immigrant immigrant's life journey and story and perspective, because that's sort of what I went through. And, um, you know, my parents were very, very new to, to the country. You know, the, some people are, a lot of people who are active in the immigration culture war sphere um, our, sec- our second generation immigrants, their parents mm-hmm. have come here and have situated themselves uh, well here. And then they have these kids who grow up in these societies. That wasn't me. I was a little bit behind <laughs> that as well. I'm kind of um, kind of a first generation immigrant myself, you can say like mm-hmm. 1.5. Right. Not quite, not quite second gen, not quite first gen, but my parents were brand, brand new when we came to the United States. So that's a big part of how I look at the world, partially because despite the fact that in Pakistan we were, you know, upper class and a lot of immigrants tend to be, especially immigrants to America, they're, they're, 
it's different with Canada, it's different with uh, the UK, but in America, many immigrants come from like these work visas that are hard right. to get if you're not mm-hmm. already, you know, somewhat of, of privilege, to borrow that terminology. So we came from that class. But when I came here, because my parents had no, you know, they had no social capital, they had very bad understanding of the English language. We were basically pushed into this like bottom rung like poor America. <laughs> right. And that's where we stayed for a very long time until slowly they they made a better life for themselves. So a big part of also of my upbringing has been, you know, uh, lower income America and lower mm-hmm. income Americans whose struggles I saw because they were my struggles partially, but also because they were my neighbors and, you know, they were my friends and I, I saw them growing up. So I have a lot of empathy for, for, for that as well. And that was actually a big reason why I called myself a progressive for such a long time, because I thought, you know, I thought these are the people that care about the poor. (laughs) These are the people that care about forgotten America. And, um, you know, I saw my neighbors just, they never had a shot, never, ever, ever, you know, from day one, because their family structure was often, you know, single parents trying very hard to make it on their own, not married, lots of dependency problems left and right, Mm -hmm. um, and no cultural knowledge of how to seek even state resources or, or non or anything to get them out of that situation. There was no understanding. There's a lot to know. Also, if you want to pick yourself and get yourself uh, you know, uh, into a different class. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I saw that you know, I noted even when I was young, I was like, these kids, they're never going to, they're not going to break out of this cycle. They're going to be mm-hmm. like their parents. And I knew that I was different because I had something they didn't have. I didn't, I couldn't articulate it as a child, as an adult. I, I, I know what it is. I know that I had all these class-based privileges that I brought over from another country, but they still, they were still there, right? Because I had educated parents and there was a two-parent household, yeah. very stable and committed. And they were very committed to my education and supporting me however they can. And these are values that sort of, that come with different classes. Um, and I had that support structure to, to propel me forward. And I knew that I could break out in a way that my neighbors who might've been just as intelligent, just as hardworking, just as capable, they weren't going to, they weren't going to be able to do the same. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, that was just, it it was a big part of my, my sense of self and my sense of like injustice and why I wanted to get involved in any kind of activism or, you know, legal work or assist, you know, what, what, how I wanted to help people, but help, especially these, these, marginalized people that are incredibly forgotten about. Um, and that is just lower income Americans who don't have any special characteristics beyond that. Mm. Um, were you uh, Muslim when you, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. My parents were Muslim. I say that they, I, I often say that they're liberal Muslims, but I, I mean, relative to other Muslims, I don't mean <laughs> liberal <laughs> and in in the western sense in the right. western sense there were like extreme hyper conservatives but in the muslim sense like i wasn't forced to wear the hijab for example i did wear it by choice for like a year or so but uh, i was never forced to wear it and it, it was a struggle to to leave for college i had to make my case for several years but i was eventually allowed to leave for college so there were there were freedoms that were granted to me that not all Muslim women and girls are afforded, but of course I had all these clothing restrictions. There was no dating, of course, no mm-hmm. see, you know, like there were a, a lot of restrictions around the opposite sex. Mm-hmm. And I decided to, I mean, I, I was a very much an evangelist for my religion ever since I've, I've always been kind of a proselytizer, you know, now I'm an activist, which is another form of proselytizing, but, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I was doing that when I was, a, when I was a kid and then, uh, it's, it started to little, little contradictions in, in the Quran, um, like in the sacred scriptures of, of the faith started to show up and I would at first I would just say oh it's it's something I don't understand yet it's my own you know my own failures as a flawed human but God knows and Mm -hmm. God has a plan and all these things and then over time it just became clear to me that uh, there are some logical problems not just with Islam in particular but just faith 
that I couldn't, um, you know, that, that I couldn't make sense of. And indeed it, 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 it was that there was no sense to them. Um, especially this like Abrahamic God, this omnipotent, you know, all powerful, all knowing God, he specifically has some, you know, logical issues. So I, I became an atheist when I was 15 or 16. I think I was 15 when I left and my parents were obviously very unhappy. I tried to break it to them slowly, just giving them questions, that kind of thing. But of course, being leaving the faith is like, I mean, there, there is no worse crime. You know, I, mm-hmm. if, I had, if I had left home and become a stripper, I think it would have been, <laughs> it would have been the end of times for my parents, but still not as bad <laughs> right. as, <laughs> as me leaving the faith. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of years after that, I decided to be more public about this and, and form an organization. And, and that was really social death for my parents, it, not just for me, it was for them because they were related to me and because they weren't punishing me terribly. They started to experience a lot of pushback from the community and really that they're they're kind of unwelcome in certain spaces because of me. They can't go visit Pakistan anymore because it's a dangerous place for them. Wow. Uh, so, you know, there's a blowback to my family for my activism and for my work that I, I wish they didn't have to go through. Um, but um, yeah, unfortunately that's one of the yeah, indirect consequences. Wow. That's, that's pretty heavy. I mean, that's, that's a heavy load to bear. And are they, uh, are you guys all okay? Are they okay with it or is it? I mean, so it's. And you don't have to get into this if it's too personal. Yeah. I mean, most of of the time it's. It, it's gotten to be better as they right. become more accustomed to a new social situation. But, you know, my, my father's brother was extremely ill. A couple of years back, he got, he like hit his head or something, had a brain bleed and then a bunch of like health problems showed up as a consequences of, of that and of his immobility and stuff. And it was pretty clear that he was going to die, but my dad couldn't go see him. <sighs> Yeah. You know, and his own brothers said, don't come. Like, I can't protect you if you're here. Don't come. And so, you know, he never, he never got to see him before he passed away. And it's hard not to feel incredibly guilty for what I've done to my, for what I've done to my parents because of the choices I made, decisions that I made about how to live my life and what to work towards. These are not decisions they made. The decision they made was to not, give me up, you know, was to, was to, they don't, I mean, they don't support it, of course, but they don't, uh, they haven't, uh, said they're never going to speak to me again. They don't threaten me. They don't, you know, say, if you come back, I'm going to kill you or whatever. Like there's a lot of honor violence also that's unfortunately normalized in the Pakistani Muslim community, but they never, they never threatened me with that. Um, Mm -hmm. and as a consequence for their tolerance, they're just a lot that they have to put up with. Wow. That's, I, I mean, it, it's, I just always think about how good we have it here, you know, even, even, and how it's such a condition of just humans to socially ostracize apostates, whether that's in, in, in an actual religion or like in the case that I see happening around me all the time with people losing friends who are prog- their progressive friends or their liberal friends because they're kind of pushing back. I just feel like your story is one of <laughs> always being an apostate. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. You, come, you come here and then you're like, hooray, I'm progressive. And then it's like, nope, you're not actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually almost wrote something about that, like a blog post about just don't give yourself a label because then if you think outside the box, then you have the apostate dynamics and it's never, you know, it's worse than never having believed, you know, it's worse to be a dissident leftist or a dissident progressive than it is to just never have been progressive in the first place in terms of the kind of social blowback that you're going to receive. It's, Um, it's so hard though. People get so mad if you refuse labels that, that seems to infuriate people as well. They, yeah, they'll say now, I mean, that's, that's fairly new to just, to just say that if you say I have no labels or if you say I have no ideology, you're in fact a fascist. 
<laughs> I'm actually, I've heard that directly. I've heard that. Like when I said that, look, I'm not going to do this. I wrote about it a little bit about how I'm done, you know, throat clearing about how progressive I am and all of that. I just, I won't do that anymore. And I'm also done with applying labels to myself. And a lot of the labels has to do with the fact that the second you put a label onto yourself, you are intellectually captured by it, whether or not, even if you're a very, you know, uh, independent thinker, and you're not extremely social person, you can't help but be pulled in by these dynamics that are extremely deeply like embedded in human nature. Mm -hmm. Um, And so just the, the act of saying, I am, you know, I am a feminist, like, let's say if I I just by just the act of saying that affects my own independent thinking. So to recognize my own fallibility and my own flawed brain and to say that, look, I'm just not going to, I'm going to willfully deliberately not put on any labels because it is better for, for me to be able to think straight about this. And, you know, even that is, has started, you know, my, to just expand on that. Like now I've started to think that even ex-Muslim, which was a political label for me and just a descriptor really. Right that it might not be something that I want to uh, hold too closely to my chest, although it, it literally is, it, it literally is true. And right. it is a civil rights struggle. So for that purpose alone, for the activist purpose alone, I, I keep it on, but I, I'm ambivalent in terms of the, the value of putting yourself in that in group and, and uh, yeah. And, and, and what that does to your intellectual honesty. It feels like it's very hard to remain intellectually honest in in these times with a just an overflow of information that never stops and the kind of as people have labeled it capital C current thing yeah. current thingism yeah and the what I always call narrative whiplash where one minute something is true on one side and then it'll, you'll get this whiplash when the narrative kind of flip flops or the power struggle changes. And I don't, I don't know. There, there are some people who are very good at keeping up with all of that. And I watch them and they have receipts and they, they can keep track of everybody's hypocrisy. And I just feel like it's, almost like an addiction that we all have right now. But I, I don't I don't know how you stay centered or grounded. And yeah. and particularly like my husband and I were talking about this last night because we were on our way to we are often invited to like Jewish holidays because of all of our friends. And I was like, I wish I had a community that, that was this tight knit and these kinds of mm-hmm. traditions and and we were talking about whether he's like, does this exist anywhere other than religion? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, I still haven't been able to come up with an answer. I'm like, I mean, I've lived in like hippie communities where you see that sense of community, although I'm not sure that they really show up for one another when you really need them to show up. Like, you know, coming together for a potluck once a week and getting stoned isn't, necessarily yeah. like a, a yeah. community. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But can you can can you think of any examples? It's it's weird to be I I can identify a lot with what you said about just finding a lot of the the same thing happened to me with Catholicism and the Bible and being a young kid and being like, well, back in Genesis, you guys said this and now you're saying this and there's an awful lot of contradictions in this book and help me make sense of it. And it always, it was just don't ask questions was the answer I always received, which didn't sit well with me. And my family wasn't, they were religious, but they weren't hardcore about it. So me not getting confirmed by that point, it was really no big deal. Okay. It wasn't something they were pushing. It was just, it might've been, but that, you know, my parents had gotten divorced and that will do something to, you know, your faith and religion, I think. And Mm -hmm. so I lost a sense of faith. And then I was, I became one of these very Western kind of people where I just sample from the buffet of 
of spirituality, <laughs> you know, like I'm like, I like this from Judaism and I, I can, I can get down with this from like some woo and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't offer that same, what I see particularly amongst, amongst my friends who have this community it just yeah. doesn't offer that. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, and that's been sort of like it, when I first left religion, I was very anti-theist and mm. I retain some elements of that because there's still, especially when it comes to Islam, it's very clear. And even you know, it, Catholicism up until more recently, I mean, there was the church scandals were pretty, pretty horrific. 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 And, yeah. it, it, and there hasn't been, you know, <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of accountability. And these children just were, uh, their their lives were ruined. They were traumatized severely. They live with that forever. And uh we just move on, I guess. We just shrug and say, that's too bad. That's pretty gross. And and look the other way. So there are elements to faith-based institutions. And I think there's it, there's a value in having that critic, you know, of, of these institutions bringing up these, you know, negative aspects of the faith. Mm-hmm. As to what you're getting at, though, in terms of, is there a community outside of faith? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think a lot in the way that you do in the sense that there is just very little, very little aspects of our lives in which we can claim any kind of a community, any, any, I mean, there's the community ideal, which you could say is represented by some, you know, local neighborhood that's extremely involved and been there a lot in in, in each other's lives. And you have a similar religion probably and, and, uh, shared value system, but it used to be that we had so many other voluntary associations that would be, you know, mini communities, you know, in in different ways. So you you would you joined a a hunting club or you, a right. supper club, and you participated in all these, you know, various little elements of of your of your life. You you had these little groups, and those groups were tiny little communities, you know, and they gave you that sense. And it it was a wonderful thing about the United States at that time and the West in general, that we were able to form all these voluntary associations that many, many people were a part of it added to the dynamism of a population that had these multiple social environments that you were exposed to. It created more interesting, diverse individuals And spaces for people to, you know, kind of foster certain ways of thinking that was separated from like this big board, you know, (laughs) all these big social pressures. And now, you know, we don't have those voluntary associations anymore. I remember, you know, I I ask a lot of Twitter polls, but there uh, there was a study from, I think he was a a Harvard sociologist, but uh, Robert Putnam wrote about, wrote a book called Bowling Alone, where he talks about the decline of voluntary associations in the United States and, and what that means and the sort of alienation that it creates in individuals who are now uh, kind of adrift, you know, like Mm. floating around and participating in this common culture that we have, like we all watch uh, Marvel movies and that's it, you know, and that's the culture and we're all, paying attention to what Lizzo is doing, but it's, he feels that people have lost something important. And I, I agree with that, with that sense. I asked on, on my, with my followers on Twitter, I asked them, you know, how many of you, how many of you have participate in fewer membership based associations than your parents did? <laughs> you know, like what, and, and, and there were so many people who said, you know, I don't have any, I don't wow. I have, there's zero, I, I don't have I participate in zero membership associations, whether that be my local community, like council, the neighborhood council, PTA, whatever. Like they they just don't have these uh, you know, mini communities that they're a part of anymore. Mm. So so much of that has to do with being online. Yeah. <laughs> so much of so that much. has to do. Yeah. I was I I wonder if this is why we're I did never read this article and now I'm going to have to go back and read it, but it, it I'm not sure. It, I saw it floating around and it was all about pickleball and how it's going to save America. What, what is pickleball? Pickleball is like, it's like fast tennis. Okay. I, I think is the only way to kind of, I could be totally getting it wrong, but it's, they have little rackets and, but it's everywhere right now and people are playing it and it, it does seem to be like, 
this the kind of modern bowling. So I, I now I want to go back and read this article because I wonder if that's what they were getting to is mm-hmm. that it's this thing that people are sharing and it's a membership and they're gathering together and in groups. But it does seem like that's still a different older generation. I'm not sure what the younger, you know, my, like I look at my my nephews and and people of their age and they're just not in the world in the same way that we were when we were teenagers because we had to be in the world to socialize. Yeah. I don't yeah. know that I would have been if I could have stayed at home and felt like I had a whole community online because yeah. I was so awkward. Yeah. Yeah. But we had to go to the mall to meet up with our friends. We had to, you know, even I even just to have to have that awkward phone call when you called your friend and have to talk to their parents was yeah. always is something that none of these kids have to do. They can kind of, I don't know, not avoid the awkwardness, but there is a there's a way to to almost entirely they can yeah 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 they're 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 avoiding it they're i mean they're they're able to control their social environments in a way just just the nature of online discourse and the nature of text-based discourse like texting somebody messaging somebody versus having a spontaneous conversation i mean the feel Mm. you know you you can stop you can think you can read and you can overanalyze, you can overthink, and you can and project, get, project, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, then you, and then you do the perfect answer, you know. You craft the perfect little uh, response. You can, you know. I mean, there's a the spontaneity of it, and I think that so much of that. You know, my personal thing. I'm going to write about this at some point because I, th- I think the key to it is that in real life there's no lag, right? But the online space is all as much lag as you need, and you can. S- Stop and you can perform, you know, you can stop yeah. and you can think about what you want to say and how you want to deal with it. So it, the interaction doesn't feel as intense and you're some, it's muffled, actually. On the other hand, and this is something I've tweeted about just kind of jokingly, but also seriously, is that I always say podcasts will save the world because as kind of the other side of that coin, you have this rise of this medium, which Mm -hmm. I find endlessly fascinating. And it's people having conversations in real time. There's not usually much editing. There's no lag. You know, there's, it's just people trying to work things out. And I think that that seems like it could be helpful. <laughs> it is helpful. Yeah. And I, I think people, it, people also love listening to, you know, conversations like this versus one person doing, you know, an essay and just reading it out loud. Like people like hearing the back and forth. People like hearing a conversation, but you know, we're having it, you and I are having it, or is the average individual having it? They don't all have podcasts. They're not all talking to people regularly in the way that they, the way that they should be. And for young people, I mean, there's this rise of anxiety, there's this rise of, you know, they're not having sex. (laughs) They're on the one hand, like hyper exposed to all kinds of pornography as, you know, perverted as you want to be, you know, like what is what choose your, your extreme pornography, and they can get access to it, and it will be free. And endless (laughs) endless <laughs> and at the same time at the same time they're not having real sex so there's something this like bifurcation of sexuality from human contact is so you know it's so troubling to me mm-hmm. um and i think it produces these people who feel a powerful sense of alienation from themselves their bodies their you know uh, other human beings and then we have you know these identity labels that that people tack on and I think it's a it's almost a way of making up for the thing that you before you could say I'm a member of the bowling you know team the local right. bubble bowling team and I you know I uh, host supper every you know three weeks for my for my church or whatever you have all these jobs and roles and duties and communities that you were a part of and you were valued as a member of and now you have none of those things so in order to create that sense you know to feel like here here I am a dynamic individual and I'm a part of things you just 
adopt all these labels mm. and they call them communities, right? The LGBTQ community. What does that mean? You know, that's right. not a community. That's not a community in any sense. It's just a label. It's just something that people have in common. If you get sick, is the LGBTQ community going to reach out? No, like it, to the extent that you <laughs> <Yes>. know people, <laughs> to the extent that, is you the know. the LGBT community going to bring you chicken noodle soup? Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a label that's separated from uh, you know, that calls itself a community and separate from all the very, you know, boring, but like real life day to day routine things that make a community valuable mm-hmm. for people and ground them into something bigger than themselves. But I think we're seeking that with with these labels and we're never going to get it. <laughs> and, right. and if anything, it's just you're, they're, you're, they're chasing something that c- can never be accessed in that way. And if anything distorts their thinking, because they've joined, oh, I, I have this identity label. So you have the the ideological stifling that might happen the second you put, put a label on yourself without all the benefits that a community that normally was attached to that, you know, ideology offers you. So it's like the worst of the worst of the label, but none of the good aspects of the community that used to be attached to it. Yeah. And it's, I mean, real community takes work, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. it's effort you it takes an effort to show up when you don't want to show up. It takes, I feel like this is something that is so, and my husband and I met in recovery and we talk about this in early sobriety. It's so helpful because the 12 step meetings become a real sense of give people a real sense of purpose and community. Mm-hmm. You have, you know, they encourage you to kind of pick up to be of service is to be a big, is a big thing in early sobriety. And they encourage you to pick up like a, you know, commitment so mm-hmm. that you are accountable to that meeting and people will get to know you and then they'll call you if you don't show up. And, you know, sometimes cleaning up all the cigarette butts or, you know, making the coffee when you have, nothing as you often do when you're rock bottom getting sober is just kind of enough to keep you around yeah and having people actually care about you and know your name and I I feel like that saved me in my early days of sobriety because I felt so adrift I had this like whole party girl you know, persona that I created. And I thought I had a lot of friends. And then I got sober and realized like they weren't actually friends. Maybe some were actually friends, but the majority of them weren't actually friends. Mm -hmm. They were people that I just partied with. But the minute that I needed, you know, someone to help me in any way, shape or form, and everybody kind of just mysteriously evaporated. (laughs) Yeah, I wrote a little bit about this on my sub stack. I had a couple of posts about community and I, I have a lot of thoughts on community in general, but I, I think what you're pointing at is exactly the heart of it, uh, that the sense of duty to one another is the fundamental aspect of a community, not the label, not the shared interest, whatever it is, but that you are that you are there to serve somebody else, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that is That is the key, the very, very key to having a community, a true community that you have members who feel that they are responsible for each other, that they are accountable for the well-being of their neighbors, the next guy in there. And it's not just a, it's not just a give and give and, and, and sacrifice yourself for the well-being. There's a, there's a very, like what you alluded to a little bit, there's a, there's a sense of grounding that it gives us as human beings to be somebody with a purpose with a duty you know to to know that you're you're necessary and needed as mm-hmm. part of this bigger collective that 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 duty is for you as much as it is for others you know it helps you right. ground yourself um and feel you know in in a very hu- deeply human way as 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 somebody who matters mm-hmm. as somebody with some significance even if that significance is just calling you know a person that that you're assigned to to make sure that they're okay and they're going to show up to the next meeting and everything's fine this online culture online communities quote unquote you know people have these groups that they join and they feel very close to them they make friends with them that's all wonderful none of those have that sense of duty right 
and people can just disappear. And they do. You know, and they do. And I saw this even in my little subscriber community that there was such a like core group of people in 2020, obviously, because people were locked down and they needed it. They needed that sense of online community. And a lot of those people probably just joined the world again, which is great and disappeared. But there was like this sense of loss in the virtual community. But there's no way to check in on them. You know, we didn't necessarily some a lot of the people in my community actually meet up in real life and they kind of transcend what I ever believed about online communities and blow me away constantly. But there's still that sense that most of the time we don't really know the people and how are we going to call them if they disappear? You know, they're I don't even know their I don't know their phone number. It's just yeah, you don't know where they, they get, live. You don't know no, their family. You don't know anything you, about them. You don't even them. know if they were who they said they were. It's just, right. it's it just real. It makes you realize that sense of where it is. Just and I wonder too if this is why you see these pylons and people going to bat for other people. It it's like if you're in this online community, that's your idea or feeling of like being of service is is to. Yeah to stick up for this idea or pile on the person who was wrong that day because yeah. you're not actually really being of service in any way to your community other than you don't have I yeah, guess, you don't have that significance tweeting. And, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad it's just it makes me sad because i i feel like there's so much beauty and joy and in, in in true community and Mm -hmm. it does seem like as the that gets lost more and more people are losing their minds yeah i definitely see a correlation to the degradation of in real life community and literally people losing their minds yeah well i mean we're social we're very social beings and that's a core of what we are we can't we didn't evolve to live this way to communicate with others this way, we were exposed to human touch frequently, even if that's, mm-hmm. you know, the your friend's mom who touches everybody and gives everybody a hug, whatever. But you had like human contact regularly that you don't have in, in this new world that we're, we're a part of. I mean, the, I think what, what your followers did with moving from the online community to the offline community is that's what I would recommend. And that's what I tried to do with the communities that I was building of ex Muslims is, is move, start it online, make the connection online because that's how people find other people now, but also in the ex Muslim case, really you're hidden and in the closet. So that really is the best way of finding people. Right. Um, but then move that to the real world space as much as, as much as humanly possible, because there's a completely different environment uh, there's a completely different experience and the kind of lift that you get from just one you know, good night with a supportive group of people that you feel like you're a real part of can can really provide you with the, the boost that you need to get through a rough month where you're alone otherwise, you know. Yeah. But it was hard. It was hard to do that. It was hard to do that, especially because I didn't understand at that point the importance of of creating opportunities to give back. So there was sort of, you know, I was creating these communities. I was putting a lot of effort in making them happen, but they weren't, you know, they were participating, but they, and and forming these social bonds, which were important, but I wasn't mandating that you have to look out for each other, you know? Right. Uh, And and in the sense of, because they knew that there was a big sister that was actually taking care of everybody. Um, Right. So they almost didn't have to because I was going to. And what I tell people now who are building real communities online or offline is that you have to create a sense of like you join this community or not, it's not for free. You know, even if, even if you're a part of a charity or a nonprofit, it's not for free. You have to either give money or give time. One of those two Mm -hmm. things, you know, money to make these events happen and to pay for the little fees for, you know, the park authority wants a license or whatever. And then you got to, you got to pay for that to get the access to a bench <laughs> for the yep. picnic. You know, the, the, you give money 
or you give time. And by time, it's like, then you organize the next meetup or, uh, you know, buy the supplies that you need, but you're, you're always giving, you're always yeah. giving back. And that giving back is such an important element to keeping the community strong and healthy. Uh, I didn't recognize that when I first started, but it became clear as I became more experienced in running these things that if if that if that isn't there, if then it's actually truly not even a community. Yeah, there has to be some sense of investment in the community. I mm-hmm. feel like again, this is what twelve steps they do a lot right in this regard. And one of the things is you know every meeting is self supporting, mm-hmm. so. You give what you can. If you don't have any money, you give time. Mm-hmm. And it's not mandatory, mm-hmm. but it does create the sense of a collective making yeah, uh, making this thing happen collectively. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that sense is very important. It's so important. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Watkins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. I feel like I I just can really identify with you in terms of feeling. I've listened to some of you and Megan, and I love how everyone's always like, Sarah's the, like Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I understand, <laughs> how, you know, how do you get, and this is where I kind of bump into my own atheism because the truly the only kind of thing for me that I can consistently turn to is gratitude. You know, that, Mm -hmm. that to me is kind of an antidote to all of these feelings of Mm -hmm. like, uh, we're fucked. What's it all for? (laughs) This is, you know, hopeless. And I feel like I always joke that this podcast, because (laughs) there was like a run of guests on this podcast and every single person who came on (laughs) said, well, it needs to get worse before it gets better. I mean, it was like three or four people in a row. And I'm like, okay, I should have named this podcast. (laughs) It's going to get worse before it gets better. That's it. I mean, (sighs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, and, and I, I feel. But how do you stay <laughs> grounded? And how do you, you know, I for all what we're talking about, like I always joke with my husband. I'm like, you know, that the thing that solves a lot of this is faith. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it 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 actually does, unfortunately. Like, unfortunately or fortunately, but. I, there's also, I think, no way to put the genie back in the bottle. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think we're going back to uh, religious communities anymore. Bowling parties, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or bowling parties or anything. Like, we have to figure out something else. Okay, so let's do positivity, uh, break out of my mold and, and, and do something that... I think w- one thing that could be a, a ray of light is working from home, uh, becoming mm-hmm. a little bit more common and not in the sense that directly as an individual working from home probably means that you actually get less social interaction and that's not great but uh, on a societal level if it starts becoming implemented more widely we will have people who don't leave their you know local communities um right you know they don't leave home i did right I, I, everybody I, nearly everyone i know that i talk to didn't grow up where we live now. Right. Um, We moved here for work, for school, whatever, and then kind of sort of set up roots. And 
But then people move again for work again. They have another right. need and something else and this exciting opportunity. And then they move again and move again and move again. So they never stop and really invest in their community and set up roots. And I think more than just set up roots, it's if you know <laughs> that your mom lives across the street, you will be more concerned about crime against the elderly, <laughs> you know, like because you know that she likes to walk take a daily right. walk across the whatever and you know and and you don't want you're worried about muggings now if you know that your kids you have kids and they go to school in this local community you suddenly you care about the schools and mm-hmm. you care about how they're run you have skin in the game because you have these valuable people in your life who are interacting with this community so now you care about the community in right. a way that you don't if you're just this very mobile you know drifting from one employment opportunity, exciting career advancement to the next. So I think that there's possibly the work from home, like our ability to work from home could get us back to local communities and, you know, living close to our moms again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that that will be, that will also help people in a lot of ways in terms of, you know, you and I have talked about motherhood. I, you know, one of the things that has been so difficult for me ever since I became a mom is that I'm not near my own family, like my family of origin where I live now. So there's, I didn't realize how necessary it was to have like grandma and sisters and whatever Uh, who are babysitters. Yeah. Babysitters around, especially when someone gets sick, when there's an emergency, like there's nobody around. I remember in the middle of the pandemic, I was reading, I was like on Reddit or something, and I was reading about uh, this one woman was posting about the fact that she's about to go into labor. So she was saying, it's the middle of the pandemic. The hospital will only allow one visitor to the hospital with me. I have one daughter and I'm pregnant and I'm, and I'm like about to get birth like anytime. And my husband is not going to be able to be with me at the hospital because he needs to take care of her and she's not allowed to come in. Wow. (laughs) So she's not allowed to come because you can't have two visitors at one time. And so she's just going to do all of it alone. The darkness of the pandemic and those kinds of restrictions is so haunting to me. Like the, those situations with pregnant women, people going into labor alone, people dying alone, that yeah. stuff is oh, like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's just another dark. But it, that, it was on top of a world in which we're already so far away from the people we love. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're already, we already need to fly to get them. I need to, do, to fly to see my parents, which meant I just didn't see them because it just wasn't safe to fly for ever and ever. So I just didn't yeah. see them for a very long time. And they didn't see, you know, their grandchildren. So in the case of this, like this woman who was writing, she was just like, I live away from all my family. We just moved to the city. I don't know anyone who could take my daughter, like who I trust, who can. So what do I do? You know, she was like asking wow. for suggestions. And I was like, this is, how do you prevent this from happening, right? Like yeah. a young couple who has no one to give their child to, and they're in a situation where this either mom gives birth alone or the, the you know, they, they hand off their child to a babysitter they don't know. Maybe this will get better with working from home and you can advance your careers right there on your, you know, at your computer. Maybe you can you can stick around into your local community and, and, you know, we can get, gain a semblance of, of that again. Yeah. I've seen, it's interesting. I've noticed in the post pandemic, like my neighborhood, I'm like, is it just mirrors everyone in the neighborhood getting to know each other? They're getting like meetups for dogs. And I mean, obviously having a kid, you get thrust into like, suddenly your neighbors care about you in a way they didn't. <laughs> It's just so weird that the other neighbors with kids, that was a weird experience. I'm like, I matter. (laughs) (laughs) You've been my neighbor for like six years and you suddenly are like, hi, (laughs) introducing yourself. (laughs) It's just, that's bizarre, but understandable. And that, I, I don't know if it's just in the heels of the pandemic, people are just thirstier for community Mm -hmm. or realizing they didn't know any of their neighbors and- So maybe that's like a silver lining of all mm-hmm. of this. I definitely wish, you know, I'm, I'm considering even moving home 
just because I have a, a kid will do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I went home with her and I saw what my siblings have and all of my family and they all live very close to one another and they spend holidays together and they're just around for birthdays and and easy to call someone and say, hey, we're in a pinch. We need a babysitter. And the kids know their aunt or, you yeah. know, it's just like, I don't yeah. have, have You don't that. have that. And it's, yeah. it's so, like, not having that is such a, I mean, that alone is like, when we talk about fertility decline. <laughs> um, yeah. The one thing, you know, that makes me think like, I don't, I, I literally cannot have as many kids as I want to have because I don't have the support system. Yeah. Um, and yeah you know, universal daycare, whatever, all these like state sponsored solutions are not sufficient. They are not no. the same thing. And I don't even think, you know, it is good for the child to be thrust into daycare after daycare where they don't like an unstable daycare where they don't, it's like a revolving cast of characters and they can't bond yeah. with anyone. If it's like a community daycare, something where they're going to know the person for years, like one, one or yeah. two, three people that they know for years, it's much better for their like mental, you know, stability and well being versus just these centers Baby that jail. are, yeah, ba- yeah, it's, it's, it's awful. Like th- those, yeah. that's not the solution. Whatever, there is a solution, but that isn't it. I, yeah, I was thinking the same thing that I would like to move back to Texas to be closer to my maternal family, you know, my, my side of the family, I guess. Um, yeah. Because it's yeah, it's, same. I, I wanted, it is the mother side of the family that matters. <laughs> it's the mother side of the family that for, it's always mattered. Like for moms feel more comfortable, obviously, like imposing on them. That's one. Yeah. Like you, if you feel more comfortable imposing on your siblings, imposing on your parents. But I think there's probably something like evolutionarily about it too, because it's like that there's guaranteed maternity. <laughs> you know, it's, it's there's yeah. not guaranteed paternity in the same way. So the investment is probably not. They might not feel the same way. I was reading about it, like, at some, I don't know where I read this, but they said that for, for a, like, my brother, the only kids, the next generation that he knows for sure are related to him are the kids of his sisters. Right. You know, because he knows that you're at least half related siblings, me and me and my brother are at least half siblings. And those kids are definitely my kids. So those are the only kids that he knows for sure are genetically related to him. He won't know that for his own kids. He won't know that for, you know, let's say we have multiple brothers, but he we won't know that for our, the brother's kids. So right. it, it's a, kind of an interesting way to look at it. I'm not quite a, you know, determinist, evolutionary biologist or whatever, but yeah. I think it's interesting. Yeah, that that's fascinating. I, I mean, I definitely, in my instance, I just have two more siblings and we're all pretty close in age. I'm the oldest of five. And they all already have kids. And, you know, it's so easy for me to go home. Like, it takes infrastructure to bring a baby anywhere. Oh, yeah. And I was amazed at just how my aunt had everything I needed. There was a, like, mini, someone had a mini crib they brought over. Somebody had, like, a a changing table pad. It was just, everybody had toys. My sister had this awesome little dome that she's had since her first child which was 22 years ago um (laughs) fisher price really does make like things to withstand she's like i've had this thing for like 22 years and it is it was like the best thing to have on the beach or anywhere we went it was i was just like amazed at how much there was already there you know knowledge of like yeah here's here's what we here's what you need to do here's what you need yeah 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 and just handing it to you instead of having to figure. I mean, these little things. Yeah, my friend. Some of my friends did the same thing for me, where they would give me tools. They were like, yeah. "This is, you know, a little uh, pacifier clipper, and these are very yeah. useful." <laughs> and, and this is a little butt spatula for. Oh, that for thing is the- amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the butt spatula is my husband and I are about to I'm like I want to pivot to mommy content because I just lo- I was so intimidated by the registry and now I'm like a baby product connoisseur oh, I'm yeah. like no these are the best onesies I like the footies you've got to yeah. have a double zipper why are you yeah. even making these things without a double zipper <laughs> or like or buttons instead that's terrible buttons. Like, it's like 10, 10 buttons Sociopaths. on like a squirming baby. <laughs> Sociopaths make these things with buttons. Snaps, okay. That's easy to get off in a pinch or a blowout, but buttons? Yeah. 
Yeah. You're just ripping those things off at like three o'clock in the morning <laughs> while you cry. <laughs> <laughs> not, no, anything with but tags too, the amount of tags on things. But yeah, a friend out here. I mean, I don't know. If she, she, I feel like she's like a secret friend. She's really liberal and she's been so supportive, like privately and checking on me and making sure when I had the baby, but like publicly, I don't think she'd ever acknowledge that she's like my friend. <laughs> And she's a she has a kid a couple of months ahead of me, and she was the one who told me about the baby spatula, and I was like, "This sounds ridiculous." And now I'm like, "This oh, thing yeah, is amazing. You need it. You need amazing. It. It's these little teeny tiny things. Like they they're just shortcuts. Yeah, and yep. and they they save you. But this is the you know the cultural knowledge that you lose when you decide to start up your own little family far away from everybody else and all connections and social. I mean, even your my friends helped me a little bit, but my you know, I have a big family too. Like I have, yeah. a, I have tons of cousins. I have lots of people. Yep, same. They could have, you know, th- there's a lot of interventions that they could have had. And I know it would have made my life easier, you know? Um, but yeah. And then we, we were concerned about, Oh, women aren't having babies. It's so taxing on a woman, just as- aside from the rearing part, the pregnancy, the, you know, fourth trimester or whatever after fourth trimester is yeah. gnarly yeah yeah and it's it's a it's such a it's such a tough thing for any woman to go through much less now you have to raise this kid by yourself uh, for years and years of course people decide to say i'm opting out of this like yeah. this is a and lot I can't be- and i'm opting i can't out. believe women are uh, expected to go back to work i mean i was back to work but i'm a, like my own business owner it was of my own choice and kind of necessity but I chose to have my own business so that that's the, the bet I made. But I can't believe like you work for someone and they expect you back in six weeks. Less. Six weeks. Less. Some women are back in like two weeks. I've, se- I've seen it. That's nuts. Like they're not, they can barely sit. They have to bring that donut to like yeah, sit this on is the where chair. I've, <laughs> this is where I've become a single issue. Yeah. Like, you know, voter. I'm like, who gives a shit about women and particularly postpartum, how are you, how are you supporting, you know, I look at my cousin who's in Germany and they got, she got a year off with every kid. Yeah. Yeah. A year. I I mean, you need at least a year, you know, it needs to be, we need to do a cultural transformation in which we give plenty of space for especially young women if possible, you know, like a lot Mm -hmm. of young women don't have it together. So that's a different story, but if you have it together. <laughs> we'll save that for another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> We're going to have it, to do a, a two-parter. <laughs> but, um, so, but here, it, 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 even if you have it together, even if you're like, you're, you're 25 and you found the man of your dreams and you want to start a family. Like, I remember there was a piece by um, Liz Bruning, I guess. I don't know how to say her last name, but she oh, wrote yeah, a piece yeah. about motherhood. Like on Mother's Day, she wrote a piece about it. I was a young mother and like, it was great. And I'm, I'm glad I did it. And I recommend it kind of thing. And she wasn't even that young. She was having kids at like 25. So it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't, she wasn't like pre- teenage pregnancy kind of situation. No, my, she sister was still- <laughs> had, my sister had her first at 18. When I read that piece, I was like, you're not that you're young. Not that, but she, like, she my is sister was like young. graduating <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> like that's young. No, she, she was, was extremely young for this like crowd of like <laughs> intellectual types who are supposed to delay having kids, even if their life is together, delay it for till they're like right, 35. Till yeah. Yeah. And then and then by that time it's like, well, well, I don't know how fertile I am. Right. I am having all kinds of like issues keeping keeping babies, like all kinds of stuff, and you still sort of see it show up. So we, we need to make it like if you're ready to have kids at a young age, um, we should have an infrastructure to support that and it should be the norm to okay, like I'm just gonna drop out of the workforce for two years and come back. And it's I hopefully yeah. I don't get too much you know, stigma for starting a little later, but you have to pay the baby tax at some point if you're going to have kids, you know, and either you pay it when you're 37 and you're just getting to be a manager and you have a crazy schedule and, but now you have a toddler too, and you put that thing in daycare or you pay it a little earlier when you have hopefully more energy, (laughs) like you can tolerate sleepless nights. Yeah, I mean that's we have to we have to think about what we're doing and why would I, I'm not a conservative, I'm not a Republican, I, I'm never going to join another party again, or at least not with the same kind of 
excitement that I, I, I was initially with in with the left and with Democrats, but why, are, why isn't this issue number one? <laughs> like, why isn't, yeah. but why isn't, how do we support young mothers issue number one? And why aren't they being creative in how they're like, I would just like solutions offered, even if they're bad solutions, even if they turn out not to really work, it would be really great to see somebody care about this and bring it up and discuss it. I only ever see it brought up at all from from the left and we need to talk about maternity Um, yeah we do oh man i could like go on and on with you so we'll have to definitely do this again but i'm sensitive to both of our our time i'm gonna ask you the same questions i ask everyone at the end of my podcast which is what is your biggest defect of character oh oh biggest okay so i have to rate them <laughs> well <it> can, <laughs> I, them. I mean however you want to interpret that what is my biggest defect of character Go i'm just I'm, t- I'm too honest and i'm just you know, yeah, i just I, care too yeah, much i care too much um i guess the one thing i would fix about myself if i could like if i could just you know wave a magic wand um i would maybe be a little bit more sensitive I think mm. I'm. I think I can be insensitive, and that might be like this, like mild Aspergers or something. But there's something. <laughs> there's, <laughs> um, like, but I, I, I think that's probably pathologically <laughs> rational. <laughs> no, I mean, there's something. There's something there, and I would. Lo- it would make my. I think it would make the people who are close to me happier if I was. Yeah. If I was that way, so that I, I think that's a big defect. I wish I could fix it. And what's your biggest asset? Oh, uh, my biggest asset. Well, actually, that mm, the defect can be an asset if you are in like a stigmatized space and you just sort of don't care what <laughs> you're just too insensitive right. to other people's emotions to even monitor them effectively and know how much you're fucking up. Nope i uh, I think I have a good work ethic. I, mm. I like that about myself. Um, I think I'm fairly rational. I like that too. I like that about you. I can I can vouch for your rational. <laughs> I mean, it's appealing to me because I I often turn to to you in situations where I'll see something complicated unfolding and I'm like, you know, there's a couple of people who are good at evaluating things rationally and and looking at well, trying to you do a good faith as best as you can unfurling of some of the cultural flashpoints. Yeah. Thank you. That um, that means so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I like the I way know. that you host them. Oh, um, thank you. Where can we find you and your Substack and your social media? Yeah, I have a Substack. You can just go sarahater.substack.com. It's called Hold That Thought. I'm trying to be more regular about posting, but I also am sort of transitioning and I want that to be my writing to take on much more, you know, uh, to be the thing I focus on. I enjoy doing it. So mm-hmm. you can find me there. I'm also on Twitter, which is more embarrassing, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel but, the same way about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. And I have a podcast now with Megan Daum called a special place in hell. And I've been enjoying it's, it's, it's new and I'm enjoying doing it a lot with her. She's really interesting person and has totally different set of experiences than I do. So it's uh, we have a we have a fun back and forth. I love Megan. Mm-hmm. She's a great person. And she's funny. Uh, and because I'm yeah, so, she's so like, funny. I'm so like dry. So it's really good to have somebody with a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> I like that podcast. And I like your dynamic that you guys have. I think it's it is a nice balance. Yeah, it's fun. It's nice to just, you know, because ex-Muslim activism, I mean, you couldn't imagine anything more depressing. <laughs> and- <laughs> I, I know. That seems like, I mean, I've had Yasmin on, I've had Ayan on, I've had, I, I, I've i talked to a lot of people and it just seems, it is like so, I don't know. My one question I guess I would ask that I didn't get to ask is like, what do you, how do you feel about what you're seeing going on in Iran? Are you, op- does it make you any optimistic or you feel like they're all going to be like quashed? It's uh, even if they get quashed, um, they're recognizing their own power, mm-hmm. which is like, I mean, if there's a consciousness developing that is 
really important, even if it doesn't succeed now, it's important that that it exists and mm-hmm. it poses a real threat to the regime. So they they will have they, they are powerfully incentivized to do something about it. Now they can either crack down terribly and be incredibly brutal or they can t- try to liberalize a little bit and keep people calm just enough that they don't that the the pot doesn't boil over too much. The fact that there's all these young women who we're seeing get attacked, I mean this is a it, it's a regime that doesn't care about obviously about hurting young women, but from a from a political messaging perspective, there's nothing more seeing more that, that you see that's more horrifying than to see a young promising like you know, 16-year-old who's hurt by by these religious thugs so they uh, they have a messaging problem that's pretty pretty severe and even in their own population uh, is is really evoking a lot of emotional responses in people i'm encouraged to see it i think it's inevitable that the regime will fall but it, it might not be now yeah uh but it's it's incredible to see these people stand up for like real issues and in you know especially when you're bogged down with our own culture wars which are so stupid and complicated so and stupid it just it feels like what what are we doing what are we living for you know and yeah. and, and here are people who see clearly <laughs> yeah um, and they're and, willing to die for it yeah. and often are which mm-hmm. is tragic but I, that it always puts that that always puts things in such. It's per- perspective useful perspective. It's, yeah, uh, as selfish as that sounds, but it's it, it is important to remember. Uh, I mean, talk what about life privilege. is really about. Yeah, talk about yeah. Yeah, extreme privilege. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again. We'll have to we'll have to do this again because I can see we have lots to chat about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about the state of the state of women next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have a good okay. day. Thanks, Bridget. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Hello. Hello. Here we are. And how are you today? Good. I feel like spun out. Yeah? Yeah. Just feel like... It's been a chaotic month. Chaotic fall energy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's just we pushed our production capabilities to the red line. Mm Mm-hmm not expecting that there would be any other opportunities or anything else that came up. And then there were, then there were, (laughs) and not to mention the fact that on our off weekends, we've both been traveling. So yeah, that is also a thing. Yep. And have more travel coming up. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. So yeah, it's just been a busy October as they tend to be. It certainly has. It's harvest season. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's good. I just feel a little spun out. I haven't had very much time to like ground center. Yeah. Do that. Yeah. Do any of that kind of take a minute and breathe. Uh huh. In one of Matilda's bedtime stories that I always listen to on repeat, there's an opening and it's like, take a deep breath and settle in. And it's like my the only time I feel like I take a deep breath and settle in all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How was your how was your weekend away? It was great. It was really fun. I went wine tasting with some friends. It was a lot of wine drinking, but it was awesome. I mean, damn good wine. My friend, we went to a, a you know, place that she knows very well and is very used to going, so she like had it all scheduled and figured out and planned, so I just had to show up, which was nice. That is nice. Yeah. Jaren and I always joke like that's ne- even in our drinking days that's never appealed to us. <laughs> Wine tasting? No, it just I remember getting absolutely shit faced because Lenny, the guy who ran uh-huh. all the wine for all of our restaurants that we, we used to work for, there were me- multiple restaurants, but he did all the wine for them. And he had this like super fancy wine tasting. Uh huh. And <laughs> I, bet I, I went to a couple of those. I just got hammered at the like to the point that I was just sitting at the bar while the guy was just like all the other people were still respectably. And I was just like eating the, it was a pairing and I was just eating the food at the bar, just slamming down wine. It was so embarrassing. Well, that was like another one of our cousins went to one of Lenny's wine tastings and, uh, you know, drunk dialed the Democratic National Convention or whatever. Yep, that was they were notorious. Yeah, no, this was I don't know that I've ever done anything like this where 
I've done, a, I guess, a few wine tastings here and there, but not nothing this extensive. We went to a bunch of different wineries. What, and set the scene for me when you get there. Do you? I mean, you you show up. They have. Do you have like, to make an appointment? A lot of the, some of the places had reservations. Some of them was like walk in, whatever. And then um, someone takes care of you guys? Yeah. I mean, someone like. Like a sommelier or something? Y- yes, but they all know their stuff. You yeah. know, like anyone who works at one of these vineyards knows exactly what they're talking about and all this stuff. So there was a lot of stuff, information that just goes straight over my head or like in one ear out the other. Is your friend really into She's it? She's super into it. Yeah, so she, she has like a wine storage locker and like, you know, that's getting full. Right. And, you know, is is very, so she was asking all these questions about specific grapes and like blah, blah, blah. Right. But I mean, it's really, you can taste the, you know, uh, my, my other friend who, goes with her a lot and has been up there a couple times and she was like I've I've actually started to really notice when I just buy a bottle I'm like uh and I'm like oh wow you know you're getting fancy tastes mm-hmm. and there isn't any hint of cherry on the well, nose of it, this one there were a bunch of places I tried where it was like I don't particularly care for chardonnay I never no, really liked it too oaky but there the, there were places where there was no oak. You know, it's not like the, there there's Chardonnays that don't taste like Chardonnays mm. that are like kind of surprising. So it's just like that kind of thing. I learned more about my own particular taste. Like I love Spanish reds, which mm. I just love, but just a lot of damn good wine. And so then they, they oh, it's usually you're just like there for the tasting. So it's usually five or six. Do they give you any food with that cheese or um, anything? No. In cer- certain places, like there was a restaurant as well, but other places you just drink and wine. Okay. And um, yeah, it was just. And how many do you taste? Five or six in like a pair in a tasting. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's small little pours. Right. Which you, you get like kind of mildly buzzed a little bit, but you're kind of ta- it, we weren't just going from she scheduled a lot of time, which was it wasn't just going from one place to the next. So, you know, it wasn't like we never got like wasted. It was just yeah. like nice drinking wine all day. <laughs> you're just like slowly getting yeah. hammered. <laughs> just like slowly, <laughs> like consistently yourself. drinking, but you're still you're not getting hammered because it's not a lot. Yeah. You know, I think all the glasses together probably consist equal one glass yeah you know and then sometimes you'll have a little more or they'll like do an extra pour for you or be like do you want to try something again or we have something else you can whatever yeah it's just it was interesting a new experience for me and i'm glad i finally did it because i've been listening to her talk about it forever yeah and i bought some good wine I'm more interested in the olive oil and balsamic place that you went to. That was so good. I actually joined that membership. We did an olive oil tasting. We like squeezed it in and it was so good. I mean, super high quality. High quality olive olive oil. oil, And it's like some of it's like just different flavors. There was like a habanero one Mm. and a basil one and a lemon one. And I mean... And then there were amazing vinegars. And then she, there were certain, she was like, oh, this basil, olive oil, and this like citrus vinegar are, would be amazing on the salad, the tomato and mozzarella Ca- caprese. Sa- caprese salad. Yeah. And I tasted it. It was like, oh, yeah, those would be amazing. And then yeah. there was like just cool guess. spices and like whatnot. So it was just, it was so delicious. I used to get this amazing basil, olive oil, and I always used it in my pesto. And it made the pesto pop just like mm-hmm. that much more. And our, you know, one who walked us through the tasting was super knowledgeable. And she's like, you can cook this here and do this on that. And she's like, I love this for this and blah, blah. And it was just like, yeah. Yes. That's what I want to do. Yeah. It was so good. I want to do like an olive oil <laughs> tour. <Taste>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could. I would just recommend going to this place and their bread that they serve with it is really good. And that part of California is my favorite. We Maggie and I were joking because we went on both like took a little mini vacation and I went to go meet some of Jaren's extended family who I haven't met. And it was like <laughs> like a half hour away from each other. We're like, we can't even escape one Book another. Book separate vacations and be more than like an hour away from each other. <laughs> but that part, we used to go up there all the time, that area, like the uh-huh. San Luis Obispo. And then you were more central, I think. Uh-huh. Um, I was in Paso Robles. Yeah, that area, like Cayucas and... Mm-hmm. We used to spend a lot of New Year's up there and 
It's my. It's probably my favorite part of California. It's beautiful. I love Cambria. I love um, like Morro Bay. Yeah, there's just so much great hiking and. It's really idyllic. You can you can live. I was saying, I'm like, if I stayed in California, I would stay up here mm-hmm. because it is just you can have such a good life and be so close to the water, but have some land and the soil is so fertile. We did tons of like basic stuff that I loved, but there were horses and we went to like this festival where you, it was like a pumpkin patch, but they had Aww, corn fun. and sunflowers and yeah, yeah, it was. An, Matilda was just like, what is happening? So much stuff and got passed around another big family. And it was really nice. It's not, it's, it was so fast and not relaxing. Uh You know, I was like, I guess you just never relax again when you have a child and go on vacation. (laughs) I mean, I hope. Until they're older. Eventually, maybe you do. Not when they're Not when they're just require so much care and attention all the time, but. And she still just freaking hates her car seat. So, but she loves people. Like she turns she it on people. in a crowd. Yeah, like she really. It, she, you brought her into a room full of people the other day, and she was like smiling yeah. and like, oh, I'm the center of attention. Oh, she loves it. I'm like, oh no, she like everyone was clapping for her because Jaren was doing this thing where she was like flying into the room uh-huh. and everyone was clapping, and I'm like, We're, you're gonna create a stand up comedian. Uh-huh. Like this is what you create when. Someone needs this meant much applause. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> She's like, hooray. I have arrived. She listened to her mom screaming, where are my accolades? <laughs> like every freaking dumpster Infused fire in utero. In the womb. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's not good, I tell you. It's not good. No, she's so she's just so happy. Yeah. Unless she's in her car seat and then not so happy. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was just nice to get away and unplug and I have no idea what's going on in the world and Mm -hmm. I kind of like it that way I love it that way if it weren't for dumpster fire I would seriously have no idea what was going on in the world yeah I feel like more and more the busier I am the less time I have to know what's going on in the world and the world just keeps going on the world keeps spinning if it's gonna stop I'd rather not know about it beforehand yeah just unplug Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)